Hey guys, it's Ray from the Teach Better team and we're live tonight for our bi-weekly family check-in that we get to do every other Sunday as a space to ask questions, talk shop, and get ready for the week. I know so many of us are in the midst of celebrating holidays, welcoming in the new year, and maybe enjoying a smidgen of winter break. But we are live tonight to get your mind thinking, maybe about how to relax, but maybe about what your classroom is going to look like this January. We'll be right back to get that all started. But in the meantime, throw in the comments where you're watching from and let us know if you have any questions or topics that you want to kick off the night with. Let's get started. <laughs> from the Teach Better team. And I'm so, so excited to already be seeing the comments flowing in. I feel like I haven't been live in ages. And when I say ages, I mean a week, but I, I went from like being live with you guys every single day, especially as we were doing our daily drop-in leading up to this winter break time. Now I've had a week away. I've been only seeing you guys virtually via tweets or Instagram stories or anything in between. So it's so fun to be here live with you now. I do want to encourage you to throw your ideas in the comments. This live, this bi-weekly family check-in only exists because we want to create a space for you to talk shop about whatever's on your mind. So whether you're still thinking about Santa or thinking about the new year, or maybe you're thinking about how your students are going back in your classroom in just a few days, this is going to be a great space for us to talk shop and hopefully get your mind at ease because this should be a reminder that you have partners, you have family members who are here to support you, and we want to make sure that you are feeling successful as well as your students are getting that success as well. I do wanna give a shout out, hey, Nikki's here. We have Olivia joining us, so good to see you guys. Uh, I always love when all of you like post, especially uh, about the holidays, about your families. It's so nice that this community, this Teach Better family is so much more than just like, oh, this is a team of educators that provides professional development. But like, I love seeing you guys. You're my family. Like Nikki, I have loved seeing all the family photos come through. Olivia, I loved your holiday card. This is the best part of being a part of the Teach Better family is that when we do things, we really do them all together. This isn't a time where we're telling you how to run your classroom. We're telling you how to live your life. Like you do you. And uh, we just want to be a part of your journey, a part of the goals that you have for 2021 and some of the goals, hopefully, that you're just finishing up in 2020. Uh, my dog is currently running around my office, so I apologize in advance if you hear him like racing from side to side. Not sure what else to do about that. That's just life here, people. Um, but let's get started with some questions. If you wouldn't mind, I'm going to challenge you in the comments right now, whether you're watching on your phone or maybe you're watching this on the computer throw an idea that popped into your mind within the past 24 hours that is related to education, teach better team, me, anything's fair game, but I would love to continue to facilitate this conversation around what topics you wanna to talk about because there's actually no agenda for our bi-weekly family check-in. We don't have a training set aside where we you know, are just gonna talk at you for 35 minutes. This really is supposed to be a conversation. So. Let's all take part in creating this conversation to be as effective and personalized as possible. And I'd love for all of you to throw your comments in the chat. Give me one idea that has popped into your mind recently about education, about teaching, about the Teach Better team, about something that we can help solve a problem, brainstorm a problem, or maybe connect you with somebody that can help. In the meantime, so good to see Brandon here. Uh, Brandon, so good to have you pop in. Danielle is joining us, which is so, so fun. And it looks like we have a question here from Livia. So let's start here. Livia says, uh, I know you do daily goal setting, but will you do one word or goal setting for the rest of the year with your kids? Livia, this is a great question. So at the end of um, our December, right before students did winter break, I actually presented them with the hashtag one word. And I wanted them to be thinking about what their one word would be for 2021. So some students did take that on and then they recorded their reflections and their words and their proclamations in a flip grid. So it's all shared between all of my students. 
We're actually going to bring that Flipgrid out again at the beginning of January when we all come back together to not only confirm that that word is still what we want to work towards, but also make sure that every single person felt comfortable. Maybe they need more time to think about their word. So the idea of one word is something I love. I love hashtag one word. If you are somebody listening right now who hasn't heard of this, it's essentially a word that's going to be a driving force in the year, in the new year. Um, this is actually, not only something that you can find the hashtag for, hashtag one word. You can actually go and check all that out uh, and see what other people are sharing as their word for 2021. Um, but it's also something that I've loved to see people take even further. Maybe they write it on a post-it and put it at the top of their computer to remind them what they're working towards and what they want their focus to be. I've seen a lot of people put this word on like jewelry. If you guys have ever seen the My Intent Project at myintent.org, they have jewelry that you can like put your one word in. I've actually done that uh, with students a few different years. One word, I'm sorry, one word is a great program, but My Intent is a great company that I encourage you all to check out. They give really good discounts to educators. And so we were able to get a really, really wonderful discount and students were able to purchase um, a bracelet, a necklace, a something, a coin with their word on it, which was really enjoyable. I've loved doing that in the past. And we actually were able to sponsor students who didn't necessarily have the money, but wanted to have this momentum. So we were able to kind of create that for the past few years. We haven't done that this year, but maybe we should. Maybe that should be something we could bring back because it feels very different when you're saying, this is my word for the year. You can't just say that and then forget about it. You have to put it somewhere, like on my desk, like a post-it or have it be my background screensaver or put it on a piece of jewelry. Or maybe this would be perfect to like get one at an expo marker and write it on your mirror uh, where you usually look in the morning. Something that really gives you that reminder because it's easy for us to set goals. It's easy for us to, to, to think about what we want, but to actually be intentional and ensuring that we are reminding ourselves of these goals and holding ourselves accountable for these goals um, and being reflective around these goals, I think is really, really important. So I saw that Livia just posted the myintent.org. Again, I have no affiliation. It is a company that has a beautiful story. The Today Show actually um, like covered uh, the, the creation of this group. Um, so I would really encourage you to go check it out. I've not kept up with all the things that they're doing right now, but it is kind of a fun way to, like I said, document your one word because one word is really a way for you to set an intention for the year. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard all the bonus episodes of Teach Better Talk podcast and maybe you've read uh, Jeff Gargas's reflection on this, but he really, really, really feels that you shouldn't wait until the new year to start a new, um, to start a new goal. You shouldn't wait until this time of year to say, I'm gonna make a change. But if you did, if you're someone like, hey, I, oh, well, I, I waited till this time. I'm ready to make a change, start anew, set my, set my sights on something bigger or greater for me, for my family, then congratulations. And it's time to get started because you do not need to wait to um, start living the word. So if you are listening right now and you want to throw your word in the chat, feel free. I know personally, I have not picked mine yet. I've seen a lot of people share patience or balance or faith. Um, an interesting one I saw was that someone wanted their word it as just be, B-E. And I was like, tell me about that. Why is that the word? And really what they meant by that is they wanted to really be present. They wanted to just be, be who they are, be who they're happy with. Uh, it was a really kind of like beautiful, reflective moment that they were able to go through. So whatever word you're thinking of, I hope that you share with our community, but I also hope that you um, take this time that we have, most of us are on winter break, take this time that we have, be reflective, and then allow yourself to support your future self who's going to forget to stay balanced, who's going to forget to be and be present. Uh, it's going to be so important that you help your future self remember the importance of this because right now you might be feeling some clarity some some you know uh, ability to kind of take a step back and find that that balance of work and home and really appreciate family time and we don't want to lose that mentality so make sure that you are finding a way to keep yourself checking yourself keep reflecting how am I living through this word? It's a really, really great project. So thank you for sharing that, Livia. That was a great question. I see Adam's here. So Adam, so good to see you. Uh, Danielle says her word is adventurous. I've heard a lot of that, Danielle, like people that are like, I'm ready to like take on challenges. It's so cool. Adventurous is a really, really good one. 
Livia says she hasn't chosen her word yet, but getting closer. I think that's important. It's kind of good sometimes to wait, 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 really be reflective, see what other people are picking. I know in the past, um, there's been a lot of times where I've like flipped over in a dictionary, right? Or uh, you're searching up adjectives or verbs. Like it's, it can be so many different things, but um, I am excited. Adam does have a one word blog that's coming to teachbetter.com very soon that Carrie and Livia run at teachbetter.com. And I'm so excited, Adam, for your blog to be released. I have not read it. Livia is in the comments saying she's read it because she's in the process of editing it. For those of you who don't know, we publish a blog every single day at teachbetter.com. And a majority of them are by guest bloggers that are from all around the country, all around the world, sharing their thoughts and insights. And I love these blogs, but I have the, the weird job of the guru. So like, if you write a blog with us, um, and by the way, if you're interested in being a guest blogger, uh, I'd love to hook you up. You can connect with Livia or Carrie. If you just go to teachfire.com, you can fill out an application. It's very, very easy. And the best part of it is that you write your blog, right? You put all your hearts, thoughts, everything in it. And then we have an editing team that makes sure it's it's as rich and as strong as possible. You get feedback on your writing. It's just, it's a beautiful process. So then when you can see your writing published, it's just so, uh, it's such an important moment for our authors that they're able to say, I wrote this, I had a team of people that supported me in doing it, and now it's officially out for the world to see. Publishing articles is always, always so much fun. And I have the weird job that with my role on the team, I actually see a lot of the graphics that get put to promote the beautiful blogs that are being shared constantly, teachbetter.com. So Adam, I saw the the image that's going with your blog, but I haven't read it. So I'm so excited to see the pairing between the words and the amazing things that you write about and also the way that our um, team put together the image to uh, celebrate the writing that you did in your blog. So that's so, so exciting. Um, great to see even Brian jumping in here. Brian, great to see you. Happy Sunday. Um, I do want to encourage all of you in case you're just popping in now, the biweekly family check-in exists to uh, give you a space to ask questions. So we've been talking about one word. I see there's another question in here that I'm going to be getting to in just a second. But if you're someone watching this and you're like, oh, Ray, I've just had something on my heart. I'm not sure how I'm going to do this yet. It might be something related to your classroom or education. It also could be something related to the Teach Better team, maybe the Teach Better family that you want to explore more. Everything's fair game tonight. Feel free to throw any question you have into the comments and we'll do our very, very best to maybe get an answer for you, but also maybe just be a brainstorming partner for you, maybe be a sounding board for you, maybe connect you with somebody who can be helpful. So as a reminder, please feel free to throw your thoughts in the comments. That's why we are here. This bi-weekly family check-in only exists because we wanna create a space every other Sunday at seven o'clock central, eight o'clock Eastern to just talk shop and make sure we are setting the right intentions for the week. We had a comment on YouTube it says, I really want to talk about the research behind the grid method. I have always known that you're supposed to spend the most time on higher DOK levels, whereas the grid method has more activities on lower DOK, DOK uh, levels. Why is that? This is a really good question, and it's actually interesting. Um, I'd like to dive into this a little bit, if you don't mind. I'm sorry, I don't know who wrote this. I know it's third grade thoughts. I'd love to dive into this and actually be able to use your name. But in the meantime, let's start here. So there is a lot of research being done on the grid method. As many of you know, the grid method was only developed within the past decade. And so from that point, not only have teachers been able to use the grid method in their classrooms, but there's also been a number of different teachers, universities, and studies that have wanted to research the grid method. Outside of the research being done on the framework itself, it also has components in it that has a copious amount of research existing within it, like mastery learning, um, web's depth of knowledge, scaffolding information for students, the idea of goal setting and reflection, the concept behind teachers being facilitators and really leading the student through their exploration. All those components have a lot of research behind them. And so the grid method framework does is it allows us to take all these best practices and kind of squish them together in a framework that allows the teacher and the student to facilitate a self-paced personalized classroom. When we talk about, though, the research behind um, the grid method, in this comment, there was a connection between having um, spending the most time on higher DOK levels, whereas then the comment says the grid method has activ more activities in the lower DOK levels. This is really important to talk about, so I'm super appreciative this question came up. When you look into the grid method, and by the way, for those of you who are hearing about it, you can go to teachbetter.com slash the grid method and read 
all about it. There's a free course, there's a full course, there's two workshops, there's so much there. But when we're talking about the grid method, there's a lot of misconceptions and pieces that we usually talk about. So let's highlight a few specifically about how the box is designed. When you look at a grid, there are more activities at the bottom, which is the lowest level of DOK. Now these activities are filling in gaps, they're confirming background knowledge with students, and it, they're usually quick and speedy activities. They're usually things where students are understanding a piece of information and then confirming their understanding before moving forward. And because it's at a DOK level one, DOK level two, these are low level skills. You're learning vocabulary, you're learning just basic concepts. When you get further and further into the DOK levels, DOK level three, DOK level four, and then the grid method even has a fifth level, which is that extended thinking, there are less activities because the activity should take more time for the student to go through. It's not so much a true false or a um, pointing to the idea, but the student is actually developing their understanding and needing to make connections between a multitude of concepts. So you're gonna see less activities at the higher level of DOK because the activities become more robust in what the student is expected to do and in the time it would take to complete the task. Now, as many of you know, not all students move all the way through the grid method. Not everybody gets to level five in a grid and that is extremely strategic. A grid is always designed to not only support your lower level learners who need more time to learn those basic skills, but also to support your gifted, your higher order thinkers with those extension activities. The beauty of it is that the standard in which you're trying to share with the student, this could be a grade level standard or a standard mandated or a target that you might be working towards, that actually is found somewhere within the grid. Now for me personally, as a sixth grade math teacher, most of my standards are written at a DOK level two or a DOK level three. Meaning when I read the information, when I read the standard or target, the language and the, the um, understanding of what you want your student to do is at that level of depth of knowledge. So what I do then is that is like the minimum expectation for the student as they are working through mastering the standard. Meaning that if a student gets all the way through level one, all the way through level two and all the way through level three, and the standards lit, written at level three, that's where I house like my summative evaluation, whatever you use for that. That's where I house that final, hey, do you understand it? This is the test or project or paper you need to do to fulfill, to fulfill the target or standard we're working towards. Now, if I still have time left where students are still working throughout that same concept, that student gets to move on to enrichment, which is that level four, potentially that level five. But the beauty of the whole experience is that your students are not only working at their own pace, but they're also getting into more complex activities, more complex learning opportunities as they continue to progress. And you know they're gonna be successful because you've solidified all their background knowledge in past levels. So when they actually start working at grade level, they are working through very rich learning opportunities that are gonna help them master the grade level standard that you're working on. So as you look at a grid in this question, like it indicates, there are more boxes, there are more activities lower in the grid. It's very intentional. That's because those are activities that are specifically aligned to a DOK level one or level two, where a student is truly just learning those background basics. Then as you get into more rich content, the activities become more robust, they become longer for the student to complete, they ask the student to do more in their thinking. This could include uh, creating something or doing a cause and effect analysis. These are more rich opportunities of learning and so that allows the student to continue their thinking. So as you're going through this, there are a lot of moving pieces, but hopefully that helps confirm why the activities are set the way they are. And to be honest with you, if there's anything I learned in the grid method is that when you get started, it's really nice that those framework exists. It kind of gives you like some parameters to work within. But I, now that I've used it forever, break the rules all the time. I add more boxes here, less boxes here, and it really is based on my students' needs and what I'm teaching. So while it does always have more at the bottom and less as you go up because of that same analysis I've been saying this whole conversation, um, I always manipulate and change the boxes because I want to make sure my students get all the information they need and have all the opportunities uh, that they need to feel successful. So hopefully that helps. I spent a long time on that comment. I apologize. Hopefully that helped define a few things. I'm seeing that there are more uh, conversation happening. 
So we'll continue this conversation as the comments come in. Looks like there's been still some wonderful conversation about choosing your word for the year. Livia was so kind and Livia threw her email in here. So if you're somebody that heard um, about our guest bloggers over at teachbetter.com, feel free to just email her. That makes it so much easier than you don't have to fill out the application or anything. Just go and email Livia at teachbetter.com and she'll get you all set up. Uh, so good to see you, Candice. And Joe is in here. I'm so glad you guys are here. And Destiny, you were the one who shared the question about the grid method. I'm so, so thrilled that you did. And now so good that I get to hear uh, your name. Your comment next was, I love the grid method. I've been researching it so much and created my first grid. I'm so excited about it, but I want to present this to my admin with research. It's great. And you know what? Um, there are a lot of different places that I can share research from. I'm not sure if you're connected to Chad Orshowski, who's the creator of the grid method, but we have tons of data that we'd be able to share with you if you're looking for that research. So I'm thrilled that you're doing it on your own, but also please, please, please feel free, feel, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, in addition to obviously the live professional development we're able to provide here all the time on all of our social media, the, the role of the Teach Better team actually is that we partner with districts to implement these best practices, whether it be a big concept like the grid method or small concepts like um, having assessment aligned, you know, instructional practices. But regardless, all that stuff, all that partnership comes with research because that's a part of what our administrative leaders need. That's a part of what a lot of teachers want to see. And so the research does exist. We'll make sure to get that to you, Destiny. I really appreciate you. Danielle says, I've been diving into SPG. Do you have a way to change the mindset of students who are used to earning points? Yes. Great question. Holy moly. Danielle, I'm so glad you brought this up. So first off, um, you guys should know that I love talking standard-based grading. I love talking grading in general. And actually, in a perfect world, Dave Schmidto would appear on this uh, video because he is somebody I talk shop with about grading all the time and need to actually have more conversations around him. Dave Schmidto is a great resource if you're looking into standard-based grading or changing any of your grading practices. I really encourage you to go check out Dave. Dave has a book. Hold on, I have it uh, here. Hold on. Oh, it's not going to come. It's in my. It's in the pile right there. Making assessment work. It's really, really good if you're looking to evaluate assessment. And actually, my favorite book to evaluate your grading. I think I referenced it, Danielle, in the course. I don't know if you took the standard-based grading course. That's at TeachBetterAcademy.com. There's two there. There's a free course on standard-based grading and a full course. But I think I refer to this book, The Repair Kit for Grading. I know this is not your question, Danielle. I apologize. But for anyone interested in grading. This is by Ken O'Connor, who's a great guy, by the way. Go connect with him on Twitter. Um, what I really like about this book, my suggestion if you are reading this book, is that it creates, it, it contains 15 fixes, is what they say, 15 things you could consider changing about your grading practices. So what I like to do when I'm doing book studies on this book with educators is I have them only read the chapter titles. And as you're reading the chapter titles, I encourage you to actually only choose a fix that you feel like is an easy one to start with. So for example, there's 15 in here. They're all relatively themed. Um, for example, uh, fix number three, don't use information from formative assessments and practice to determine grades, only use summative evidence. So what I would encourage you to do is read that fix and say, do I agree with that? Is that easy for me to say, yes, I totally agree? Or is that hard for me to say, oh, I'm not sure that I fully agree with that concept? If it's something easy for you to implement, start with that one. Read that chapter and implement that fix. If it's not something that you're sure you agree with, put it off to the side for now. I've seen some really good activities and my administrator uh, that I work for right now, Christopher McGraw, actually did this activity with a number of teachers. Um, oh, gosh, this was years ago. I don't know, five years ago, six years ago where he had us go through the fixes and we identified them as red, yellow, or green. Green meaning we already agreed with it. Like for example, a fix in there is don't put zeros in the grade book. So for some educators, they were like, yeah, I already don't do that. That's an easy fix. So that's where they could start. They could read the chapter, kind of solidify their understanding, maybe tweak um, small things, but more or less it was an easy fix. Or if someone labeled that as a yellow, it would be like, oh, I agree with it, but it's gonna be hard for me to change, but I'm like leaning more towards that understanding. Or if you label it as a red, that means it's gonna be really hard for you to get to that point. So don't start with that fix. So don't read the book in order, that'd be a recommendation. 
Um, just start with the things that you're comfortable with, but that actually facilitates a great conversation. All right. That doesn't have anything to do with Danielle's question. <laughs> I apologize, Danielle. You know I love talking about grading. So Danielle says, again, she says, I've been diving into standard-based grading. What's one way that you can change the mindset of students who are used to earning points? Um, Danielle, it's interesting. Anytime, whether it be a student, an adult, it doesn't matter. Anytime somebody is changing something that they are used to, it causes strain, it causes frustration, it causes confusion. And we have to work then as a facilitator to try and move us beyond that point. And so when you're talking about changing a mindset, it takes time. I think that's probably the, the most challenging part of implementing anything new that is drastically new for our user is that it really takes time. You have to chew on this idea. You have to practice this idea. You have to question this idea. And, and for a lot of educators, that's scary. They don't want to implement something new that there are going to be questions about constantly. And, and, the, and for me, that really means you're not ready to implement it. Now, you can be scared and also acknowledge, but I have a family, like the Teach Better family. I have a network that's going to support me in these questions. I don't have to know all the answers. And that is then, when you know that, that's the time you can start implementing. Because you don't need to know everything. You just need to know somebody that can help you with something when you need it. So for me, when I think about changing the way, changing the mindset of our students, it's really going to go to being consistent with our routines and our language. The biggest struggle, the biggest piece, I guess I articulate this in the course that I have at teachbetteracademy.com dealing with standard-based grading, is that standard-based grading is a great concept, but the main goal I see of standard-based grading is that it facilitates conversation around something no one's talked about in a really long time. And so as you continue to facilitate conversations around student thinking and, and what score they would get and what level of understanding they're at, you really, really want to foster that conversation. But with that conversation comes very strategic language use. And I talk about this again in the course as well, where you need to choose your, your, your feedback to students and be exceptionally specific with your language because no student knows what a 75% means. But every student can know what a strong understanding means. And the difference is that when you're talking about standard-based grading, you're really creating a strong connection between the numerical number and the vocabulary connected to that number based on student understanding. So you're no longer giving arbitrary numbers to a student as feedback. Instead, you're picking very specific language to provide very direct feedback. So do you have a way to change the mindset of students who are earning, wanting to earn points? The mindset that I would suggest is to continue to focus on the idea of learning, being on growing, being on completely mastering a concept, and being um, something that is different. Like acknowledge it's a different way of thinking. Have them see it as not the same. It's different. Um, there's a few activities that I have that maybe you should swipe. They might be in the blogs, but if you go to the academy, um, especially the free course, I'm sure the free course has this activity in it. So don't buy the full course if you don't want to already. But definitely one of them has a set of activities that you can do with students where they can practice the proficiency scales that you'd be using in standard-based grading. And the only value of students practicing the proficiency scale is so they create a clear understanding of what each scale represents. The first activity I always do with them is coloring in a turtle. So I get this clip art of a turtle. You guys could just steal this idea, write this down. You can duplicate it, go do a really good Google search. So you make a box, um, you make a number of boxes that is your proficiency scale. So in my example, I use in the course, it's a four uh, step proficiency scale. So there's four boxes. If you have five or six step, create more boxes. So in each box, I put a turtle. And with the turtle, I ask students to model the target. And I put the target really big and bold in the middle. And the target is how to color in the lines. And so we talk about what does a one look like? What does a two look like? What does it mean to master this idea? What does it mean to go above and beyond in this idea? And really, really make it targeted to your specific proficiency scale. Because then you really get to see how the coloring in the li lines evolve. And it also is a beautifully organic way to foster questioning. Because when you get to mastering coloring in the lines or going above and beyond in coloring the lines, you actually get to have incredible conversation around what does that mean? 
for example, all my students always come up with coloring the turtle different colors. Well, that's a great idea. And I'm sure it would make for a beautiful art piece, but it doesn't necessarily make you any better at coloring in the lines just because you're capable of using different colors. And so it really does foster discussion. And the reality is Danielle and everybody in here that's exploring grading, it's not about having the right answer necessarily. You can use your network for that. You can keep researching, go take courses, go read books, but it's about allowing your students to shift their mindset and involving questioning in that mindset shift is a huge value. So hopefully Danielle, that gives you some ideas, but my uh, challenge to you to sum it all up would be definitely to shift mindset with questioning. Um, I love that you appreciate my explanation. That's awesome. Can you find a third grade grid example? Um, I'm not sure if you've been in our Facebook group. That's a really good spot to go. Teach Better Team uh, in our private Facebook group has a bunch. But I definitely would also start going to educationblueprint.org. Educationblueprint.org is a nonprofit that actually houses free resources for teachers, and they have a grid section. So I have no idea if people have been sharing specific third grade ELA grids, but I do know for sure that there are grids there that you can swipe from. So even if it's a second grade or fourth grade, hopefully that gives you something to work off of. So that's educationblueprint.org. Um, all ideas are worth something, that's true. Uh, another comment here, what's the name of that book again? Also, where can I find the parameters for standard-based grading instead of using percentages I would like to use? Okay, so first part, uh, this is called a repair kit for grading. Repair kit for grading. Sorry if the light's in the way. It's by Ken O'Connor. And if you seriously just search 15 fixes, 15, one, five, 15 fixes, it's going to come up. It's a super popular book. It even comes with a CD. I don't know what the CD is. DVD. I don't know. It comes with the DVD. I'm just telling you. But I have, this is actually not my original copy. I wrote all over my original copy. So I think it's funny that when I grabbed this earlier in the video, I was like, this is like a brand new book. I don't know where this came from. But this book is really, really good if you wanna facilitate conversations around grading. Um, when I have principals or um, curriculum instructional leaders that reach out to me that say, hey, I wanna start shifting my district. We talk about timeline. It's usually about a seven year process depending on how long your big your district is. Um, but I really recommend this book at, for a pilot group. Because going through each chapter, um, depending on if it's an easy fix for somebody or a or not an easy fix, is actually really, really great discussion to start off in. Some of the other ones in here is um, don't consider attendance in grade determination. Report absences separately. Don't include group store group scores in grades. Only use individual achievement evidence. Um, don't include student behaviors. So again, it's like all these statements as the chapter titles. And so you can decide, do I agree with this? Do I not? How easy is that to tackle? And the reality is, guys, some of these are not going to be up to a teacher to manage. Like, for example, um, what was the one I just read? Uh, don't consider attendance and grade determination. That's usually something a teacher can control. But if it's not, and it's required by the school, then you can't control that one. So it's a red. So leave it and do the others. Because the reality is, is that as you start this process, things and conversations become more relevant. Um, don't reduce marks on work submitted late. So that's like about late uh, work. Don't assign grades based on student achievement compared to other students. Compare each student's performance to the present standard. Again. Really, really good repair kit for grading. I refer to it all the time. When you're ready then to evaluate your assessment, I really encourage you to, I'm not gonna be able to grab it. It's right there. It's Dave Schmidt's assessment book that just came out. Um, gosh, was that this summer? That seems like ages ago. Uh, that's a great one if you wanna like evaluate the assessments you're providing students. Um, as far as parameters for standard-based grading, um, I could go on like a super long saga about standard-based grading but I'd really encourage you to take the free course over in the academy. It's completely free. It doesn't cost you anything. And I walk you through a lot of basics behind standard-based grading in a very easy to chew on. I don't mean low level, but it's like, it's the basics. It's what you just need to know. Where's this all coming from? Why are people talking about this? And it also goes gets into like, and how do you want to go get started? And then it gives you a multitude of resources to start doing that. So if you're actually interested in finding more about standard-based grading, there are incredible books, there's incredible articles, there's incredible blogs, go, go, go. There are so many experts, but I actually refer to a lot of them in the course. So the free course, 
might give you enough that you can then go and reach out to the expert that really applies to the work that you specifically are interested in within the standard based grading mindset. I don't know if that makes sense, but hopefully that can help you be successful in this. All right, guys, we've been live for 34 minutes so far for our biweekly family check-in. I do want to go over a few things going on with the Teach Better team, but I'm also going to do a last call, whoop, whoop, last call for any questions, comments, or concerns that you want to throw in the conversation here before we end our biweekly family check-in that happens every other Sunday, uh, both on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch to try and support you uh, any way we can because we care about you and we love you and um, we're a family. So I'm so thrilled that for some time tonight, we're able to kind of talk through and talk shop and support each other. It's really, really good. Um, as you're typing your last final questions in the chat, I do want to give a little shout out to two things. I know there's a bunch, but I'm only going to highlight two, if that's okay with you. Two things going on with the team. Now I want to preface. There's a kajillion things going on with the team. So stinking many. But these two are important to you listening. So here are the two. One is, I see somebody already posted it, that we have a 12-hour live event happening on the 29th. So it's two days away. Holy moly. We are doing 12 hours of free live PD. We have over 40 people joining us as guests for conversations. And every single hour or half an hour is themed. So you're going to be able to actually look at the agenda and choose what hours you want to pop in for. Or you can join us for the whole 12 hours. It is going to be so fun. The entire team is getting involved and we will literally be live with zero breaks for 12 hours from 8 a.m. Central to 8 p.m. I'm sorry, 8 a.m. Eastern to 8 p.m. Eastern. So that's 7 a.m. Central to 8 p.m. Central. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because the Teach Better team might exist partnering with districts and like that's how we make money. But this is something we really believe in. I don't care what educator you are, where you work, the types of students you support, we all deserve to be a part of rich conversation to get the training we need to make our students successful. This is just one of the many ways that the Teach Better team gets to do this. And I'm so excited to talk to the amazing guests that are joining us. We have some amazing sponsors who are going to be doing giveaways. We have giveaways galore. I think last time we did our 12 hour event in like July or June, we gave away like thousands and thousands of dollars of stuff. So stay tuned. It's on the 29th. If you need the agenda, uh, check your email if you're part of our listserv because I've sent it out twice and I'll be sending it out again tomorrow. Um, but also you can DM me. I'll send you the agenda if you need it to make sure you have it. The other thing is super important, super important. We are doing an end of year survey. I know it sounds lame, but like the Teach Better team is truly, we have a Google form. We're doing a survey to our network strictly because we are setting such big, audacious goals and dreams for 2021 that we really want to make sure they're the right ones for you. We want to support you. And so you need to fill out the survey. Now, here's the deal. If you fill out the survey, you, you are in the running to win a $100 Amazon gift card which might I say, I could really use right now. I don't know about all, all of you, but I would be dying for a $100 Amazon gift card because I definitely enjoyed the holidays. But now I'm like, oh, money, sign me up. So if you want to, a chance to win the $100 Amazon gift card, you need to fill out the survey. By filling out the survey, you're automatically registered for a chance to win the $100 Amazon gift card. So please fill out the survey. It will not take you long. It's a series of questions. Most of them are optional, like uh, multiple choice. You can just click, 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 click. And if you need that, there is a link that I can send you if you DM me, but I can also just tell it to you right here. I'm going to say it slowly. So if you want to write this down, it is dun, 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 bit.ly. So bit.ly slash reflect TB 2020 slash reflect TB 2020, all one word. So that is the survey link. It should direct you to that Google form. If you can't find it, just DM me, just DM the Teach Better team. We'll get it for you. Um, but I just was so excited that we were giving this away. Not only so many giveaways happening during the uh, 12 hour live, but also who would want an Amazon gift card? And it's an easy survey. So please do it. It'd be awesome. All right. Hi, Jody. I see that Jody jumped in here. Hey girl, I miss you. 
Um, so good to see you. And Danielle, I'm so excited. I hope you guys are all tuning in for 12 Hour Live. Livia is actually hosting some of it, so I cannot wait. Livia, you're going to be awesome. It's going to be so much fun. I did go grocery shopping today um, to make sure I had snacks because I really needed some snacks. I also um, bought more coffee because there's no way Ray's getting through 12 Hours Live without coffee. And I also got tea because I was thinking, I was like, if you have me talking for 12 12 stinking hours. Woo! That's why we have guests. It's going to be fun. All right. I'm going to head off. Thank you to everyone that joined our bi-weekly family check-in this evening. I wish you all nothing but incredible, incredible New Year's. And I hope you continue to be connected to the Teach Better family because we love you so much. and We just want to support you. And if there's anything you need, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to get you connected in any way we possibly can. So Thank you for all that you do. We'll be seeing you during our 12 hour live and everything else going out with the Teach Better team. And uh, have a wonderful week.